Welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, to host Nina and Florian this evening to present the work of their practice by our Bishop Berger architects. I'm particularly excited to hear them speak this evening since they represent, beyond the exquisite quality of their growing body of work, a very unique and inspiring form of constructing practice. To quote Juan Herrero's title for the incredible series that he has led here at the school over the past few years. Moreover, Nina and Florian are no stranger to this place. Nina graduated from the MARC program in 2000 and Florian from the AAD in 2001. And so this represents a kind of return and I'm delighted to follow uh, with them their trajectory this evening. After meeting at Columbia GSAP, I know they'll tell the story, so I won't tell it. Nina and Florian moved to London, I'm telling it a little bit, to work for Arab and Richard Horden, respectively. And in 2005, they founded Bayer Bischof Berger Architects, capturing the formal and digital experiments for which the school was known at the time, and combining those with a keen interest in structure, fabrication, and a strong commitment to building. Nina and Florian cut their teeth on art exhibitions and storage facilities, as well as on private commissions that ranged from residential homes to high-end offices. To those, they added their own residential developments in a spirit of creative entrepreneurship. We hope they learn in some part uh, due to their time spent here at the school. But beyond the type, program, and scale of the projects they engaged, it is the approach they developed throughout which is enticing, as they have assembled different attitudes to create one that is very much unique and their own at once infatuated with formal expression, but also with an obsession with construction and detailing, as well as an embrace of structural opportunities to produce such expression, simultaneously geeking out on parametric design and fabrication, while also bringing great lightness and a sense of humor to their work. At once traditional in their respect of the gallery as white cube and ready to subvert such art spaces. The work surprises in its ability to bridge discipline and craft with formal freedom, playfulness, and a drop of irony. Of special note are their projects, Nopenhalle, Wellenhalle, and Glitzerhalle, which belong to a series of former factory buildings converted into art exhibition spaces, where textile notions have been translated into built form as if to, quote, redress these buildings as they have said, but also to influence the atmosphere and experience of the interior, interior spaces they contain. Inside, a multitude of materials, details, and varied settings shape movement and light to transform the gallery space and its experience. This approach can also be seen in their residential projects, where density, privacy, and intimacy have played central roles in their exploration of how we live today. They recently completed Courtyard House, which was featured in the 2018 December issue of Wallpaper Magazine, demonstrate beautifully such approach to form and structure to create a special sense of place. Their lectures this, e this evening, I am told, is conceived as a reflection on their experience at Columbia and the realities of the practice of architecture which they encounter after they left. Please join me in welcoming Nina and Florian this evening. Thank you, Amal, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, it's very exciting uh, to be standing here um, on the other side of this room after having spent so many lectures um, sitting here and listening um, to other people. We've entitled this lecture See You in 20 because this is where here that we met 20 years ago. We both arrived at Columbia, having learned to draw by hand with a May line and to ink our drawings in our previous schools. Although we had worked with computers before, the reality at Columbia was completely different. We were using animation software from the movie industry and design programs from the car industry. And rather than to learn to draw architectural drawings, we were visualizing data, developing patterns, and playing around to explore the potential of these new tools and toys. I added this slide this afternoon, photographed out of an old abstract. This is essentially an app before apps that I programmed for a Nokia phone in a pre-smart phone era, the class I had taken here. Except for a housing studio, it was not uncommon that there were no plans, sections, and certainly no elevation drawings at final reviews. We were not necessarily learning to build buildings, but rather to explore ideas. 
In this project, in Hani Rashid's studio, we used motion capture of a gymnast to manipulate and create a virtual space. The studio's projects were exhibited at the 2000 Venice Biennale, making us take the first steps to building these ideas. This structure was produced without a CNC machine, but was rather cut using templates from our drawings. Columbia opened up our view to, of what architecture could be. We experimented with new tools, we borrowed methods and strategies from other fields and took inspiration from everywhere. The outcome was open. Sometimes we felt things were slightly superficial, but at least they looked really cool. <laughs> Consequently, or paradoxically, whichever way you want to look at it, we left Com Columbia with a strong desire to build. We continued to embrace new technologies as they became available and tried to use them in aid of our architecture. Tonight, we would like to show you our work in this context, the process of taking ideas and how to build them. So this is the title of our first section. Um, upon leaving Columbia, we were faced with the reality of commissions. And w while you have um, great sites and great ideas, uh, when you're here at uh, Columbia, uh, we were commissioned to uh, reconfigure the attic of this typical single family home. Uh, the, pair, the people who lived there wanted to have a place to escape from um, the reality of their everyday and their three kids and, and leave uh, Zurich for a, a different sort of atmosphere. Uh, just previous to this commission, we had uh, been asked to design a fountain um, in the Swiss Alps. And we had designed this uh, rather sort of sculpted uh, fountain and um, had real difficulty trying to get this built. Uh, we didn't know how to build this type of uh, uh, design at the time, and only sort of with a stone mace and chiseling away would we have been able to get it constructed, and so had to resort uh, to sort of building a boring Swiss box. Uh, when we got this commission, we certainly didn't want to build boring Swiss boxes. There are plenty of architects in Switzerland doing that. Um, we wanted to look at the things that we had learned at Columbia and fold the dormer windows out of the roof landscape. This was our site, the space under the roof, and we decided to really um, sculpt the space inside of it. Uh, we made computer models and uh, attaching points, lines, and surfaces, we really created a sculptured surface. Uh, we split it up into sections, used uh, our favorite uh, tool, the unfold button, and made paper models, um, sort of testing um, the virtual space in a physical space and went through various iterations of this. Um, this was sort of um, the closest we got to a floor plan in this project. And it was more to sort of indicate that there were um, other spaces in here, sort of the sauna, um, sort of a, a bathroom, here's some storage in the attic still, um, and over here in the sort of a library that doubled up as a guest space, offices, and sort of a lounge area. But you couldn't use this to construct. And what we also found, that we had the problem, is that we had created um, a, a model that really was only consisting out of a surface. So you can't build sort of something that has no thickness. And so we actually had to um, have a script written by a student um, to actually give our model a certain thickness. Um, and he then sort of had sort of the blue lines being the ones he had, and he had to calculate the thickness for the red lines or vice versa, I'm not quite sure anymore. Um, and it also then defied, defined the mitered edge between the different planes so that as you constructed it, you actually would then be uh, creating the angles of the geometry that we had designed. And here you can sort of see on the left all the different pieces that had to be produced. This data was sent to uh, the carpenters, and then um, on the CNC mill, all the pieces were produced. They were assembled in the garden here for the dormer windows and hoisted up onto the building. Um, inside, these are sort of old digital pictures, so bear with us that they're a bit fuzzy. Um, we had the staircase carpenters cut um, all the, take all the pieces and put them, sort of start assembling them. They were the most familiar with complex geometries. Um, and so you sort of see the roughness of trying to assemble this type of um, design. Well, we also had the problem here is that we were actually quite naive. This was the beginning of our practice, and we had not allowed for any tolerances. We had this perfect geometric um, 
cloud space in our computer, uh, the reality was that the attic space was nowhere near as perfect. And so as you were starting to build on one side and build on the other side, all of a sudden they sort of the pieces would meet here um, in, in places like this and they didn't necessarily always meet up. And so there was a lot of uh, fixing different um, corners on site of improvising. Um, but soon we managed to actually create the cloud space that we wanted. Um, we had spent a lot of um, money and time and effort to um, polish up all the, the, the holes at all the joints um, and then uh, to paint the space. Um, this is sort of the final outcome. We definitely gave the clients what they asked for, a space that was completely different than their home, a place that they could escape the every day from and sort of forget that they had three children below that were making noise and being impossible. And these are the Dharma windows that we finally built. It took us uh, a year and a half to get planning permission, but we, we managed to push it through. And these are not the renderings. Uh, the second commission that sort of goes in this line came shortly afterwards. It was a gallery space that friends of ours had rented, um, but it didn't have any walls. So you sort of think, why would you rent a gallery space without any walls? Uh, well, they came to us and said they also wanted a triangulated space like that we had just built in the attic. And first, we were slightly reluctant to build two buildings that sort of were designs that were quite the same. But when they told us they basically had um, no time and no budget, we realized that this was going to be a completely different project. Uh, we were going to have to design away everything that was expensive. And we took the challenge happily um, and designed them their triangulated um, object in their gallery space. Um, we also learned from our mistakes in the first project. So instead of just having a wireframe model, uh, this time we went for the parametric design. And it, this allowed us really to put all the information that we needed for construction straight in the model. Uh, we could define the thickness of the slabs. We could uh, design away the corners, um, all the things that we needed to do. But again, we unfolded our model and built lots of physical models. We find it really important that you can actually see the space and not just in, in a virtual um, aspect. What we also did is we sort of took the most expensive portions of the other design and put them away. Uh, we didn't want any mitered corners, so um, we just left these open. Um, it also allowed us the CNC cutting of these pieces to be a lot more simple. And we designed uh, these steel angles that you sort of see here that we're going to define the angles that were uh, sort of the, between the different elements. Um, we sort of had these designed by an engineer and sent them straight out of our drawings uh, to the manufacturer. These are all the different pieces that had to be cut. Um, and then they were delivered on site, as were the angles. And then how do you actually communicate to anybody how to assemble this piece? Um, this is actually the drawing that we handed in for planning permission, um, which just showed a sort of a projection um, of the model from the top. Um, but this was not really going to give the people any um, idea of how to build this. And so what we delivered were not uh, construction drawings, but a construction model um, with the numbers of all the different panels on them and um, also the number of all the angles and where they went. This was then used on site uh, to assemble the project within three days. And here it is, the gallery space that although it has lots of um, angled walls was quite interesting. The artists were also asked to engage with the space um, and see what they could uh, do with it. And it was a very successful gallery um, that had a lot of great shows. Here you can sort of see the angles on the outside. Um, and finally, um, the last um, exhibit that was there um, was by an artist called Christian Jankowski, a German artist. Um, and he wanted to turn the project into a tableau vivant. So he asked us to design clothes for the workers in the gallery um, to blend into the architecture. And so not being really fashion designers, we did our best. And we uh, delivered these paper models uh, to a, a fashion producer in Berlin. And these four costumes were then produced, um, turning actually this whole uh, gallery space into an artwork and is now stored somewhere. And um, if you have a lot of money and want to buy a new artwork, it's, it's for sale. So just sort of go, to back, go back on this, um, we had sort of come sort of designing something having not the slightest clue how to build it. 
Um, and then we had sort of experimented, put all our, our effort into this project. Um, uh, we sort of came in second place in a competition at this time where we're really happy to have the money um, from that to sort of put into research of trying to figure out how to build a triangulated surface. Um, and then finally ended up here um, optimizing this, uh, reducing the cost and make it actually feasible uh, to construct. So I'm going to move on to Florian who's going to present the next project. Well, with triangulation out of the way, let's build with a liquid. Um, Nina did this, uh, those two objects for a class here at Columbia on material investigation. My contribution is that I prevented her from, from throwing it away when we moved from New York to London and later from London to Zurich. Um, it's still sitting in our office in the entrance, reminding us that concrete is a liquid in its first form and you can give it any shape. Um, and that is the basic premise that we used on multiple uh, projects that we did. To give you a bit of sort of spatial context, uh, this is the Lake of Zurich. At the upper end of the lake, you see the city of Zurich. Um, and we marked with factory an area um, that Nina's father had purchased. He's an art dealer, an art collector, and he wanted to house his collections and his operations in one place. And he, he acquired this old factory area that you, you see in an aerial view um, and while, when we were moving to, to Zurich in 2005, he was in need of an architect and in a leap of faith sort of gave us our first commission. Um, this drawing shows um, the area more or less in, it, in the state that it is um, in today. Um, the blue building being the, the first commission that we got. It looked like this. We had, for legal reasons, we had to keep the existing structure, at least the main steel frame, because we would have only been able to rebuild this much smaller uh, since the, the area was overused. So we had to work with the basic um, volume that was there and the basic structure. So we went here. The brief was uh, for an exhibition space. He wanted four spaces of, e of, of, of equal size. Uh, a central axis to walk through, um, and that was about it. That was the brief. Um, he was also very worried that you would take a, somebody would take a truck and run it through the wall and steal the art. So he needed something that was very solid from the outside. Since he liked exposed concrete, we saw the chance and convinced him to do uh, big prefab panels to to make it safe enough, essentially. Now, there we were, basically with a huge box, 50 meters long not that many uh, openings, entrances, or windows. Um, and we were both excited and a bit uh, scared uh, of how to treat this. And we resorted of an idea of classic architecture parlante, if you like. We wanted to show that we were actually wrapping, padding, protecting a, a content that was very valuable and very delicate. Um, we had sort of certain analogies. We wanted to make this hard material soft and we went for petrified bubble wrap as a programmatic uh, title for what we were trying to achieve. We started in a very, very um, old-fashioned way by drawing a line and rot rotating it to get the basic shape. You see sort of several attempts here, and then we created a, a diagonal grid to make this into a continuous pattern. The first test was then also a rotational object, not on the computer, but really done uh, by a joiner, by a carpenter, um, to create the first positives. Then the negatives were cast, again positives, and so it was multiplied. And on the right-hand side, you see um, the, the, the test we did in one-to-one -one in concrete that we then eventually signed off uh, uh, to produce. We had to figure out how big the panels could be, and um, they're sort of four by four meter panels. And we really uh, tried to make sure that you have this continu continuous wrap. And that meant, for example, that the joints between the panels couldn't run straight through the, the bumps and cut them in two. So we had this meandering joint um, where, the, um, where the panels would meet. What was even more uh, difficult was to uh, work with the corners. We figured that we couldn't just stop the pattern and start again or do a mitered corner, for example. We needed to run this pattern around the corner uh, uh, sort of around a rounded corner. 
uh, which was technically quite difficult to produce because you had these bumps so sticking out in all directions. And what you see on the right-hand side are rubber molds that were put into the formwork. And we had in the end to really lift the cast piece up and physically um, pry them off the cast concrete. You see here, that's the first mock-up of the corner in, uh, in the office, uh, in, in the factory, Nina in discussion. Um, we were quite happy with the result and uh, went on to produce this. Uh, this shows you the assembly. This is one of the straight 4 by 4 meter panels, 420 uh, bumps on it. You had to sort of lift it in vertically and then slide it over horizontally because of the mandarin joints very delicately and they all fit together. Um, and this is the final result. Um, the idea of creating the softness with this hard material. Um, this shows you the, the sort of the long main elevation which is actually north facing. This is early, early morning sun. Um, that was also a reason why we really worked with that shape to, to, to create that, that softness because we didn't have so much direct sunlight creating shadow on the, on the main elevation. This is the sort of short end and, and the back um, showing you the continuity of that, of that wrap. This is photographed up the corner and with a diagonal grid it obviously gives you, gives you quite, some, quite sort of nice uh, perspectives. And at night, we have a strip of light running right in front of the building, which transforms it in something else than altogether, because the light only catches the front ring of, of each bump, and sort of over the height of the building, uh, the building sort of fades into the, into the night. On the inside, we had this continuous big room, um, a shed roof that was sort of spanning two sheds, spanning the length of the building, gave quite soft light, and we wanted to maintain part of that quality because it was actually very well um, uh, uh, suited for art exhibition. But we had to sort of subdivide it into those four rooms. We made sure that those rooms would not touch the, the ceiling uh, or the roof structure, kept, kept our distance, painted it gray, and made sort of the, the roof uh, space bright white where the light's collecting. And you have a very soft uh, uh, um, atmosphere, light condition uh, in the exhibition rooms. People, people go and touch this building. We quite like that because that's not what you typically, well, as architects maybe, but normal people don't touch concrete buildings per se. Um, and the more daring ones like our daughter sort of start climbing up on it. It also uh, gives way to all sorts of associations. We had the local gardener bring his, his kids uh, on the weekend to show them the Lego building. Uh, people are reminded of wine racks and we found this on the internet where somebody sort of took took uh, the tentacles and added them to the building. Um, a few years later, the next building was up uh, for redevelopment. You see it here in blue. Um, it's been later dubbed um, the Papadella Halle. You'll see why. This is the existing building before we started um, working on it. It's bigger than the first one. It again uh, was supposed to house four rooms. Um, you see sort of a floor plan here. Uh, equally sized again, but uh, with the added um, uh, second floor that was to house some storage spaces for smaller object, which is the, the top right um, floor plan that you see. Uh, what we essentially built was a house in a house. Uh, the steel structure we had to, again, we had to keep, uh, still holding up the roof, but uh, the lower wall walls of the new rooms would actually carry the, uh, the, the, the seating, the intermediate floor for the upper rooms. We brought in uh, some daylight into the lower room at the end of the rooms, uh, and then there was um, the wish of the client to have a colonnade. Um, this building is facing the internal courtyard, and he had this idea of extending the exhibition out into, into this space, putting sculptures there, fountains, trees, and have that, um, have that dial dialogue between inside and outside. Now his notion of a, um, of, of a colonnade was probably quite classic in a way. You have this balance between uh, the, the, the solidity of the outside and uh, the transparency of the transition. Um, but we were sure that we wouldn't want to uh, build a, a Greek temple in the outskirts of Zurich. So we had to come up with a, a contemporary notion of a colonnade. Um, we tried lots of things and then ended up uh, with um, putting actually a cloth ribbons across the entirety of the building and then have the wind blow in and sort of slightly opening it up. We, we tried to build a physical model. Um, we destroyed this very shortly afterwards because it was, it was so um, 
we were worried that it would put off the client, let's put it that way. I'm showing those photographs anyway, because uh, the, the right-hand side gives you this idea of the view from the inside out and that filter, the colonnade as a filter between the inside and the outside. Um, well, we called it Pappardelle because we have these bands that were twisting, and the way we, they sort of developed, they reminded us of, of, of noodles coming out of a pasta machine. Um, this time again, we had a, we had a basic curve with a, with a Noppenhalle, with the bumps. We started with a curve, rotated it. This time we had a basic curve um, and went with a parametric model where we first subdivided that line, put handles on it, then rectangular sections. In the next step, we tapered it from uh, uh, top to bottom. And then you see the, the section remains perfect rectangles where it meets the slope of the roof, but it then becomes lens-shaped towards the bottom. Um, and then we started rotating it the way we intended it so that it would open up in one direction. Then the solid object. And um, with this, uh, we went uh, also always interacted with the structural engineers and with the concrete company to optimize it in terms of uh, the, 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 the structural optimization and, and fabrication. And what we sort of mentioned earlier, we did, what we did is um, we printed 3D um, models of it to really check and uh, the, the shape and how it worked on an actual physical object. One to one is a really great scale. Um, to, to, to do, and they're, they're, eight, they're, eight, they're eight meters tall and um, the objects are five tons heavy. So they're quite solid objects in the end. And to manufacture them, we needed a proper machine. This is the formwork, it's on, on rails. You have two halves that can slide apart and together. So you slide them apart. What you see here is that you have the, uh, the, um, the reinforcement uh, put in. You would then later sort of push, them, push it together. Here somebody's sort of still working on the, on the, um, on the reinforcement. Then that it would slide together. You would fill in the concrete from the top, have it set for a day, and then lift out the cast element. You would already hang it in two loops on, the, um, on a crane, and then open up the formwork again and slowly uh, take out the cast element out of the factory. Uh, you still see the loops on this one here. It has just basically left the, um, the fabrication area. And we had 26 of them, so they were starting to pile up before we actually uh, took them to site. Now what you see here is that you don't only have to account for the load case in, the, in its final state where it sits, but also f during fabrication and, and transport and installation. Uh, they were sort of resting on these, on these uh, red structures, then being pulled up, put in, finally put in sort of vertical, uh, uh, in a vertical position, rotated, and then set in front of the building. Now this is something quite interesting because we did first sort of render, rendered images of this, and always had this notion that it looked like a succession of, of, um, of these um, elements sort of opening up at, sort of towards you. Um, and we sort of, we had the idea that this was only um, really in the, in the, in the two-dimensional representation. And of course, I'm only showing you a photograph here, but I invited to Cirque. It really sort of works that way, even though we, are, of course, have 26 identical pieces here. Um, this is the solidity from the other side, so we also achieved that, because the other one is the main approach. This is basically the view that the neighbors have, that you have from the outside. It's been dubbed the armadillo from here. It's quite hermetic and, and closed off. Um, well, our kids would say it's very Instagrammable. The optics are really quite nice when you sort of walk through. This is the actual space of the colonnade if you sort of uh, walk to, uh, through it. And this sort of, uh, if you think back at the crappy model we did, is really delivering on this idea of having that filter between inside and outside. Uh, it's now being filled with art, and you have that sort of connection of the art exhibition on the inside. We're not quite as far on the outside. We have still sort of uh, uh, trade, trade people working there, and not, not that many art pieces outside. The, the rooms on the, on the ground floor, are, um, the short, short length is 12 meters, which is quite a distance to spend with a, with a flat um, ceiling. Um, we used concrete in a different way here quite efficiently and cast these arrays of um, hollow plastic bubbles, balls that are a bit bigger than a soccer ball um, into that slab to save weight by, uh, while maintaining the full structural uh, sort of uh, integrity of, of that slab. And this is the corridor in, uh, upstairs which pierces through the entirety of the building with uh, storage spaces left and right. Um, 
and in the end we just put a window because it really goes from one end to another and the perspective you have the end what you're looking at are the neighbor's trees. This is the third project. They're direct neighbors, they're all interconnected, but they were built uh, sort of one after another. Our client was not the one for ma a master plan. He really, uh, and frustrated us in the beginning with that, but uh, we sort of then settled on organic growth. We s thought it's a bit like a city. We tried sometimes in a speculative uh, way to put in connections uh, that we could sort of take up on later, later but um, we really had to sort of work from commission to commission. This is the building, and initially the plan was to make this a windowless, uh, windowless storage space uh, adjacent to the exhibition spaces that we had, and um, he then changed his mind and made this maybe the most public area of, of, of um, building of the whole area, which is the gallery, um, gallery offices and gallery exhibition spaces. On the right-hand side, uh, these are the offices. Um, sort of single cellular offices because it's quite a discrete business. People need sort of their own individual offices. They're basically grouped around the perimeter. Um, uh, then some additional rooms in the back and the, the, the white spot is a central atrium that goes through the both floors of those offices to bring some light in to, uh, uh, through the roof into the, un, into the internal office spaces. On the left-hand side, the full height of the building is an exhibition space, and we sort of turn it around. We sometimes uh, call it the Ying Yang building because we have this sort of box in the middle, um, and the exhibition space runs around it. The central box is the only c entirely artificially lit room that we have to exhibit art. It can be part of the exhibition, and you open the big doors and you just sort of wander through, but it's also uh, possible to close it off and have it as a, as a separate space, for example, for a client to show some individual paintings that you bring up specifically. Uh, specifically. Um, this gives you a sort of a very basic uh, uh, model, shows you the two floors on the right-hand side for the, uh, for the offices and the full-height exhibition spaces on the left-hand side. Now, this was the initial idea. That we had already started designing this, um, this external um, windowless box for the storage. Um, the idea was to, we had this notion of redressing those, those uh, existing structures and uh, with the Noppenhalle and the Papadella Halle had sort of found def different type of sort of wrappings or textile analogies and we had thought of weaving this sort of bronze metal sheets around that, uh, around that um, volume. Um, now we had to come up with something else and we needed actually quite a few windows. Uh, in the meantime, we had also started work on a different project that we're sort of not showing here today with a metal facade and had actually thought it was a good idea to do these buildings that were grouped together um, always in the same material, so we wanted to switch it to concrete. Uh, in a way, we turned the weave around. We so went from sort of this vertical to horizontal waves and stacked them on top of each other, creating the screen that we were uh, uh, then to set in front of the actual perimeter of the building. And here it is. Um, it's a filter again, a bit like the, the Papadelle, the colonnade is a filter um, to control di uh, direct light, sunlight, and to give a bit of privacy to these offices, uh, especially on the ground floor. Now the object, this, the singular wave, is not as uh, complex in a way as the Papadelle were, um, but in this case we had actually uh, an array of different pieces that would sort of uh, create the screen together. And you see here how, how many different pieces there were. The green ones um, show you sort of a basic straight wave. Um, since it was an existing building, we couldn't optimize it in any way, so the diagonal had a slightly different wavelength. Uh, so it was a different piece, different cast. We had these two different corners, and we had the end pieces that you see in red because we did these loops in the end to make this really an aut autonomous object, that screen, that was sort of uh, looped in, in the end. Now, this shows, you the, uh, this, this shows you sort of the anatomy of one of those waves. Um, with the Papadelle, we had to use um, stainless steel reinforcement because they were so slender, so thin, that we couldn't do it any other way, which is quite an expensive thing to do. And in this case, we needed to avoid this. So what we, we kept a, a 10 inch, 25 centimeter um, height uh, always in the center of that, of that curve. But to make it uh, sort of look more, more, more elegant, um, the amplitude of the, the front contour and back contour actually sort of goes, and i um, try to show you this here, basically 
Here you start with a D that is flat at the bottom and is rounded at the top. Here in, 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 the, in the intermediate section, it's basically this, the perfect lens. And then up here you have an inverted D which is flat on the top and then rounded on the bottom. And, and this way sort of this, this section sort of changes over the course of that wave, uh, giving you a more dynamic shape uh, while maintaining the, the thickness of that element to, to do a reinforcement that can be standard steel. Uh, again, we did um, a one-to-one -one mock up. We really wanted to test that shape uh, in the sense that we wanted to understand the, the, the human scale of it, um, whether you were sitting down, whether you were standing, how you would relate to it. Then we're switching to the production. Uh, that dinosaur skeleton is the reinforcement cage for one of those waves uh, that were pre-produced and then put into the formwork. This shows you the formwork. Now we had these, uh, um, the, the elements that you saw at that colorful um, um, drawing just uh, previously. Um, the ones that where, you, where you could cast many of them be made out of steel. Uh, so you could many, do many casts out of one formwork. But we also had corner pieces that we only needed two or three times uh, and we made them out of, out of uh, we made wooden formworks for them um, and needed really a coating that made sure that the surfaces of the steel and the wood would look alike and it took some attempts with the coatings of those wooden formworks to, to achieve that, but it would have been insane uh, to, to make them all out of steel. Now they're piling up. We did a test assembly and it's good to show you sort of the foundation because we didn't just want to put this on a straight uh, a linear foundation. We wanted that screen to be really abstract and only just touch the ground. So we did these half eggs. Um, they're sort of sticking, just sticking out of the gravel and, uh, and that's basically the, the, that's where the screen is sort of touching, touching the ground. Then we went, went on to, um, to assembly on site and that is the finished result of this wave screen. Um, the factory originally was between two villages out, out sort of in the, in the fields uh, and is now being completely surrounded by residential areas of, 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 suburb, of, of Zurich sub, sub, suburbia. Um, and we wanted to show that we were different when we're not a residential project. So this sort of slightly enigmatic or alien appearance was very much intended and we hope, hopefully we're friendly aliens, but uh, we wanted to make that very clear by the exp expression of our architecture. Looks cool in the snow and in the rain. Um, this is at night when sort of the light is on on the inside. And this is a, a quick view of the exhibition space on the inside. Um, and uh, what was important to us is that that wave screen was also present on the inside. We really wanted the threshold between inside and outside to be the wave screen and not so much the glass facade. So um, we made sure that you always sort of would have that notion of the screen and the reference of that screen also in the inside spaces. We're walking around that box quickly. You see it sort of on the right hand side here and here um, sort of hung sort of full of art. And that, and that wave screen always present. Um, over on the other side, in the, in the offices, that's a central atrium. Um, that atrium is being used very informally to put up art. It's changing from time to time. These are uh, Mike Bitlow's uh, not Warhol Brillo boxes that we're stacking up here. Um, and upstairs, you have a um, library area. Uh, and again, you see sort of the waves, the perimeter of the building defined by that screen. The notion of the privacy screen uh, was sort of made a mockery of by our kids that sort of started to cl climbing up and uh, started living in it. Um, and that's it, um, over to Nina. So now we're gonna switch materials. Um, previously, we, we, we looked at these buildings here, um, which all have these liquid concrete um, uh, sort of analogies. Um, we had already started working on this um, area here, which was to house um, the collections. The collections um, have design, furniture, glass, ceramics, um, and a lot of folk art. So there's a different scale, different type of objects. Um, and we were asked uh, to design an exhibition space for those, um, for, for those storage areas. <clears throat> and as we'd already looked at um, sort of metal facades there, we decided we needed a textile analogy um, here as well in, in the metal um, idea. This was the existing building um, and the steel frame that we had to maintain. 
Um, the brief was to have two exhibition space above each other. So we created um, a very intimate um, space at the top, sort of a floating box, um, and um, a more public sort of semi uh, some semi-private space down here, um, sort of semi-private because you're going down, uh, but sort of only semi because you have these big glazed windows um, allowing the light to come in. And you can sort of see here, we um, sort of propped uh, the structure away from the um, elevation and took it back into the building, sort of allowing for this visual connection um, into the building here. Um, just briefly here, sort of this was the, um, the service core that connected the two stories of um, storage uh, to three stories of exhibition space, and three stories being the entrance, the lower floor, and the upper floor, um, and they were all on different levels. We actually had to connect all those over there. Um, this is sort of going back to the to the site condition. Um, we had originally designed here the Noppenhalle, expecting people to come down the road and come inside here. Um, when we uh, had to design the Wellenhalle, um, all of a sudden the situation changed. People were coming in here, they were going into the Noppenhalle over here, or over into the Papardele Halle, and we didn't really essentially know how people were going to be entering this building. Uh, were they going to be coming from this side, or were gonna they be coming from this side? And so we created a, a symmetrical building. Um, so one that you could um, come in on either side, it didn't matter. You could uh, walk through it, you walk, could walk by it, look into the glazed um, um, edges. And here we sort of propped the building up um, because we had to maintain the steel frame for, for coat. This is the exhibition space that we created below. Uh, you can clearly see sort of the glazed uh, sort of area here where you can view into the space. Um, and it was a big open space, it was sort of multi-use, flexible. Um, we weren't allowed to put any walls in there. He wanted to be able to be uh, um, independent of those in any exhibition space. Here are the spiraled staircases that sort of take you up and down. And we worked quite hard to make sure that this was a perfect spiral, even though um, there was a landing here in between. And this, you sort of see um, a sort of a snapshot one evening when we walked by. They had already put some um, uh, furniture here in, and you can sort of see just how transparent uh, that walk along the edge of the building is. Um, what we're not going to be talking about tonight in much detail um, is our details um, and how much effort and time we spend in making sure what we build is perfectly and beautifully detailed. Uh, these are just some two pictures sort of give you a little bit of indication of this, of the work that we did on the staircase and the railing, um, and also here as it, it meets the, the concrete slab. This is the upper exhibition space, um, which is much more introverted. It's a private space. Um, it's also a different scale because we wanted to offer the opportunity to show design furniture um, in a much more intimate um, environment. And we worked also very hard to design away um, all the disturbing factors of exhibition spaces. Um, often if you go into a gallery, you'll see where the spot tracks are, you'll see where the ventilation comes in, um, you see sort of the fire extinguisher, all these things that you actually don't want to see if you're actually primarily there to see what's being exhibited. And so here, um, underneath where the trusses had been, we actually put the, the lighting of, of the space, but also these are the tracks for the spots, and um, the other slot is where actually the fresh air comes into the building. And we also wanted a good lighting condition, and so we created uh, these skylights between the, the two trusses um, to get a sort of a diffuse, beautiful, natural light into the space. And here, just give you a sense of a bit of scale, um, this is sort of a temporary um, installation of some of the folk art um, that's in the collection, uh, put on these funny uh, rolling tracks to sort of see what's in the collection, what could you use, how could you use it for an exhibit. Um, and then we get to the hairy building. Um, we decided we wanted to make a hairy building, um, sort of a carpet uh, surface, uh, something that was sort of textile, and delivered this sketch, which was basically a statement of intent. Um, this is an inverted version. We, we don't know which one we sort of like better, um, but it was, a, it was an image that we showed to the client, and he liked it so much that he carried around it in his wallet for quite a long time. Um, he doesn't have any pictures of his family, but he did have a picture of the building, uh, which we were quite pleased in. Um, and then we had to figure out how do you build a hairy building? What is a hairy building? Um, what is it constructed out of? So here we go, attempt number one. 
Uh, we thought, okay, hairs. Uh, we went to a brush company. Um, toothbrushes are built, still made in, uh, sort of made in China nowadays, but street cleaning equipment is still produced in Switzerland. Uh, we looked at what type of products they had there. Um, this is made with a natural fiber, which of course we wouldn't be able to use on the exterior of our building. So we sort of combined, combined these two ideas and created our first mock-up of what sort of a hairy texture, sort of a carpet could be um, for this building. Um, we then experimented um, with, uh, with sort of densities um, and, and grid, uh, whether we cut the, all the, the bristles in the front or whether we let them um, be all different lengths. Um, we hung out outside for a couple of months to see if we're going to have uh, spider nests or dirt in there and also to sort of see what this is going to look like. And although it was a really great object up close and you sort of had this glittery, strange, spiky but soft um, texture, um, when you sort of went from a distance and looked at this project, you realized there was just basically a black surface or it looked like um, a balding one. And uh, to sort of have a lot of steel and a very expensive uh, sort of in terms of its material, we decided to abandon this and uh, continue to our attempt number two. So as we were going to maybe be exhibiting furniture, uh, we went to Sofa Springs, uh, industrial material. Uh, we called up the company and said, um, if we would like to buy 30 kilometers of stainless steel um, springs. Um, and uh, they sort of paused and they said, how big is your sofa? <laughs> <laughs> we then continued to try to explain that we were actually trying to build a building with them. And we made some uh, renderings just to see what this could be. Uh, we experimented here. This is actually a physical model uh, with a corrugated sheet in terms of how do you attach this. Uh, we looked at sort of whole, hanging them uh, vertically, but then they made so much noise with any wind that would most probably drive everybody completely crazy. Um, and so then we said we had to create a new system. And so we designed these um, diagonal, super custom-made um, supports to hold an industrial product. Um, we sort of took here the, the model, we cut a, a line through the diagonal, these are the dots that we were cutting through, and then these were the uh, design of these custom-made supports. Here, um, some of them were manufactured. The idea was that you could sort of push it in, clip down, and they would be held in place. Um, and again, we built a mock-up, which looked very promising when we had it outside of our office. Uh, we brought it to site, uh, we held, hosted it up on the building. Um, the lighting condition was such that um, we immediately abandoned this attempt. So we were at attempt number three. By this time, uh, we were quite far along in the construction, and everybody was like, what's, what's the outside of the building going to be? What's the, how are we going to build this? And everybody was getting nervous. We have our own construction managers um, in the office, and they were really uh, getting on our case. And so we had to sort of look what we had around. And we had these drawings from our previous attempt. Um, so here you see the, sp the springs. And we sort of sort of looked at them and said that actually there's something else in this two-dimensional representation. We could uh, produce something um, out of it, this, this idea of these undulating uh, fingers. So here are the fingers of my son um, that are coming up, and we were going to decide how to interlock them. So this is the first uh, model that we made um, in the office out of paper to try to sort of represent this idea. Uh, we looked for other inspirations of what this could be, and this is more of a shindle um, sort of analogy from a butterfly wing, um, and tried uh, these cardboard models out, uh, what the sort of shindle effect would be and what the interlocking one would be, and we definitely decided we liked the interlocking one better, and how do you build these? Um, so the idea was sort of to create these spines with the fingers coming on either side so that you could actually slot them into each other, so here we're slotting into each other. Um, and we wanted to sort of have a random effect. So um, in cardboard, you can sort of pull them in, in, into any position that you want. Um, in uh, stainless steel, this is a completely different condition. You were going to have to bend them into the angles that you want. So we defined all the different angles. And then we had to actually script a uh, grasshopper program to make sure that we don't have any collisions when we slot them into each other. Um, this is sort of the first rendering that we did where we sort of showed what this would look like and um, we didn't really like it because there was sort of this repetitiveness. You could sort of see uh, repetitive patterns appear um, in it and so we decided we need, desperately needed to get rid of this. Um, so we needed different strips with different angles on them. And what we actually managed to do is to create two different ones, so number A and number C. 
are the two ones that we designed. And then we put them upside down so we actually had four different um, strips to be able to use. Here you sort of at the bottom shows you the different angles um, that we sort of bent the metal to. And then we created an assembly system. If we were just given these to the, to the contractors, they would have assembled it in any way they wanted to. So we had to create our own randomness. Here you see A, C, B, D, A, B, C. And we mocked it up to make sure that we got that randomness and that a non-repetitive nature of this carpet that we were trying to produce. And uh, we're quite happy. So we went to manufacturing. Uh, we were cutting these out of a stainless steel sheet. And we wanted to use, um, have a little waste in the steel as possible. We couldn't just cut um, sort of the, the lines around back and forth because of course then there would be no tolerance. We'd learned about tolerances uh, by this time um, to slot the pieces in, in, into each other. So we actually had more time on the laser um, but less waste. Um, and here they're uh, being cut in the manufacturers. And this was a special um, tool that was put into this compression um, thing. So this is the top bit, the bottom, the compress. Um, and each one of these here has a different angle so that when you um, put the steel in, you end up with these different angled um, pieces. Um, and this is uh, the finished uh, sort of effect that we achieved um, and the finished building. Um, and we really, I think, achieved sort of this carpet, this hairy um, look uh, that we had, we had wanted. It looks different in different lighting conditions where the suns are shining or it's diffuse light. Um, sometimes it even glitters. Um, just briefly, uh, we also created some um, custom pieces here uh, where we cut out part of the fingers so that you could actually use, have a window behind it and you could see through the screen. Um, and you can just, just briefly see it um, in, in, in here. And I think we, left, we lived up to the promise, um, our statement of intent. Um, and, the, and, the, and the project that we delivered, I think they match up and I think we're all really happy with the result. Um, the hairy building was then nicknamed the glittery building due to the se sequence dress of my daughter uh, matching quite perfectly with, with the background. So just quickly, the last project, where we're going to go back to timber. Um, we. Uh, recently completed a uh, project, a residential project. Um, this was a, a new build, so it uh, offered us different possibilities than the conversions that we have uh, just shown you. And um, the project was located um, here in sort of the suburban situation, but they actually had a very large plot of land. And so they were very exposed to all the neighbors uh, who could basically look onto their property and see where they were. And so what we decided is to create a courtyard situation, allowing them to have some outside space that is really only theirs, and wrap the building around this courtyard in which we planted also a tree. We hope that the tree really grows and becomes one with the building in time. Um, the building sort of um, has this undulating roof sort of to match sort of the landscape, the mountains that you see in the background, and also to turn its back to its neighbors um, so that it sort of can't see what's happening at the front of the building except for where you sort of go right through the building into the courtyard and into the entrance situation. Here's the front of the building. Uh, the courtyard sort of opens up. It's not completely enclosed uh, with a sort of, and you also see the large windows which are open to the view of the mountains and the lake in the distance. And as you sort of enter the courtyard, you really see that we've created a room um, that can be lived in. It's, it's an additional room to the building. Um, this is similar to another project that we just built previously, which was a development, which we unfortunately won't have time to show tonight. Um, but the idea of that you can create outdoor spaces that are uh, rooms that are just as valuable as the interior spaces um, that you're designing. And even you know, in different uh, seasons, uh, you are sort of orientating yourself constantly around this courtyard. So here, just quickly to show you the floor plans. Um, so we sort of had this idea of extending the project um, into the landscape, sort of to creating paths that you're moving through. So you're coming down from the streets, this, the carport, you move along this building into the courtyard. Um, inside here, this is sort of a, a guest uh, apartment that they wanted. Um, and then you move into the building here. Um, you have the coat room, the staircase in the corner, kitchen, dining room, and living space. Um, and you can also go in the other direction. This is an exterior um, dining room that's sort of semi-covered. 
And then on the top, uh, we wrapped the, the bedrooms um, around the, the buildings, really creating uh, the, the space that encloses this courtyard. And it was important to us as you moved through the building that you were continually seeing the courtyard, that you were sort of orienting yourself in the building. And so the corridor actually runs along the inside perimeter. We created windows here that are sort of a little bit like train carriages that you can actually see through um, from your bedroom um, out into the courtyard, even though um, you're actually an interior wall here. And on the top floor, there's a uh, private office space. So this is just to give you a little bit um, an impression of the interior. We worked a lot, lot with surfaces, with textures, with colors, uh, working with the details that we had so painstakingly designed in all our um, com more commercial projects, uh, bring them into a residential context, uh, played with surfaces, um, and we also managed to choose the, the furniture for this living and dining area um, and go all the way to interior design. Um, so it's quite nice to see sort of the transparency um, of the building because it's only like one room width. Uh, the living space is double heighted. And um, if we sort of make it look back to the process, um, this is quite complex ge geometry. Uh, we had tried to design this with Revit, um, through Revit right back out the window. Um, you cannot design this type of geometry in Revit. It's just not going to happen. Um, and not only that, but you also have to have some sort of communication tool between yourself, uh, the, the engineers, and the contractors. And um, although we had made a, a, a 3D model, the, um, the uh, contractors asked the, the, uh, the engineers to deliver them this uh, framing model so that they could actually take it to site uh, because we we're going to prefabricate the building. Um, so we, took, we, we had the panels delivered, and they were assembled. And just like in the project right at the beginning, we had numbered uh, pieces of wood that had to be assembled according to the, the 3D model that they had uh, pr provided. Here you sort of can see uh, that we had decided we wanted it's a sort of expressive uh, zigzagged uh, roof structure. And here this is our concept model for that, uh, trying to sort of see how that would work. Um, it also had not only sort of the ben sort of the beautiful aesthetic of it, uh, but also had a practicality aspect of it. The fact that we had this undulating roof, we wanted to triangulate uh, the structure so that it um, would give us flat surfaces that we were going to be cladding and putting insulation on. And here again, um, for the for the contractors, um, as, as the, the roof structure, and this time also the cladding. And here, this is a few pictures of the interior, where you can continually see that. OK, let's wrap this up quickly. I hope you get a sense that we tremendously enjoy the way we're working. Um, curiosity is important to us, the excitement in the work. But we don't think it's narciss narcissistic uh, or self-centered, but it's actually sort of what fuels the process. It's how we get other people aboard, as architecture is always a team effort, and it affects many people. That starts with the clients and with our own team. And then we take the engineers, experts along, and we challenge them and ourselves to create new path uh, and a different thinking. Um, we try not to make architecture a pure problem-solving process. We're working intuitively, sometimes non-linear, jumping around, things occur, Myth misunderstandings can actually bear potential. Um, the idea for one project pops up in, a, in another. And I think here at Columbia, you all know this kind of process. Um, it's playful, it's fun at times. Uh, it can also be nerve-wracking when no solution seems to, seems to occur. Um, with the way we work, we aim to create architecture that people can relate to. Um, spaces you enjoy to use, to spend time in, that fit around you and enhance your life. Buildings that create or augment our environment that inspire and communicate. We have learned to take ourselves and the way we work more seriously over time. We found that in the building industry, among craftsmen, entrepreneurs, people with cool machines, 
or great knowledge and old techniques, you find plenty of partners in crime. You find people who love a challenge, who know things we don't, who are happy to fill you in and bring you up to date. People who like cra crazy ideas and love turning them into reality. Those are our friends, our partners and teammates. In the end, architecture is a very public affair. It is out in the open, built to last, part of our environment, our culture, our future. It is a lot of responsibility, but we have found that with our approach, the serious play, things can actually work out. It's obvious to us that our time at Columbia is an important influence on what we're doing today. And we are convinced that you, the students of today, you're way ahead on a completely different place probably with your thinking, your ideas, your priorities. On the other hand, we um, firmly believe that architecture is a field where you don't become obsolete over time, where, you can exper where experience has a value, uh, where you can grow with age. In this sense, we're looking forward to competing with you and see you in 20. Thank you. Well, thank you both. It was really uh, wonderful to see the work, but also to hear uh, you speak about it. Um, uh, obviously, it, it's uh, as unique a practice as practice can get. I mean, it's like an architect's dream. Uh, here's a you know a playground of buildings uh, that you are uh, sort of approaching and experimenting with. Um, no master plan, no, I mean, there's a kind of real, uh, you know, you mentioned kind of organic growth and um, no windows, <laughs> uh, <laughs> except for the house that's like heaven. Um, and, uh, and the kind of real um, sense that you can start with the most creative kind of idea or analogy, a material exploration, and then kind of build your way. Um, your way from there and so I mean you you mentioned at the end a little bit the team and and at the beginning of the presentation uh, the kind of translation or where uh, drawing stopped and construction started and I was curious as the process and the buildings got more complex uh, how much of that process have you redefined or in terms of the boundary between uh, you know, drawing and, and building and that feedback loop, um, as well as the relationship, maybe to speak a little bit more with um, the engineers, the builders, is that a team that you, you know, that's, you know, a kind of uh, single team or, or do you move from one project to the next? Or um, I imagine that the, the kind of experimental nature of the practice has also yielded quite an experimental Approach. I mean, you're you're like like you said, like Revit, not going to work. So, are you you know what are the tools that you've developed kind of over time in, in terms of the the work process? Yeah, well, um, with regards to the team, um, our own team is quite sort of the people that we employ have very different backgrounds. Um, there's more speciali specialization going on over time in the beginning. We had that notion of everybody could be doing everything in, in the practice, and we see that people have sort of individual strength and, and individual backgrounds, and we're trying to get everybody to closely communicate. Now, we have our own construction management in our, our office is small, we're 14 people, and we have three, con part of that are three construction managers. They are completely different, sort of, they have a different mentality to architects. So you have some culture conflicts in there that you have right in your practice, and that most of the time that's a good thing. Um, but um, it also then extends out with the sort of uh, engineers we're working, uh, specialists. You, you assemble your team of people that you like to work with that don't necessarily always have to be the same people, but you need a certain mindset. And you learn, and that's the same for manufacturers, the concrete companies, for example. Some we've used once, some we have used repeatedly, because you need that spirit of people that really want to sort of, that, that want to come along. Um, and that sort of falls into place at some point when you know what to look for, and I think it just sort of happens over time. Yep. 
we spend a lot of time talking to the people. Um, um, we certainly have certain engineers that we continually use, but that doesn't stop us um, if we have a project and we sort of see, well, actually this would be suited for an external advice, we'll, we'll go find mm -hmm. it. Um, and also when we're sort of tendering projects, um, in the end you have to sort of see, you know, even if you have a preferred contract which you've had great experience in building something with, um, if they don't deliver on the price, um, you're going to have to go with somebody else and you're going to have to build up a new rep, uh, sort of experience and a rapport with, with a different contractor and trying to come up with a solution. Um, but the, the construction management team has been really crucial for us because we can control what's happening on site a lot stricter. And we can also um, figure out very early on um, what costs what, uh, where can we save money, um, what is the most expensive part of the building. And um, a lot of these projects look incredibly expensive, but a lot of the expenses were designed out. Um, so yes, I mean, obviously, if you're going to put a corrugated sheet um, on one of these uh, exhibition spaces, it's going to be cheaper. Um, but it's not cheaper if you're going to put a stone cladding on it. Um, and even the, the single family home, we had somebody come and sort of say, oh, well, you know, you must have, you know, had so and so many million for this project. And we said, actually, no, we, we spent half. And they were stunned um, because they said, well, you know, I, I just um, sold this house and um, there was no built in furniture. There were half the materials and it was a complete standard box uh, for the same price. Um, we're trying to design um, well so that you can actually design more for the same price. So, um, so, so I mean, just um, you still produce a complete set of drawings, or is, is there is there or is there kind of uh, if if we can um, if the drawings are useful, we produce okay. drawings. But you, you can, <laughs> but you, right? That's what I mean. So you also have given yourself this ability to sort of work uh, more in a more hands-on way, or well, what's really interesting, I think, is that many things are produced from our drawings. So it's not that intermediate step. It's not, we're drawing this, then the carpenter takes it, he draws it again, he sends it back, we check it. Um, but we are actually doing these models. We're sending them back and forth. And that is an uh, extreme sort of step in efficiency. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. helps a lot. Mm -hmm. So how long, how long have you been working on the, the, the compound? Uh, I think we started. Um, 14 and a half, 14 and a half wow. years ago. I can always sort of tell because I know how old my daughter was when we started. Um, we, we've been working the whole period of time. We're still now, um, there's a large concrete uh, prefabricated building um, that we built that we didn't show tonight. Um, we have one um, storage where we showed the metal facade in the last slides that's uh, under construction now. Uh, we're adding another floor to another building and we're going to be building a bridge to connect the two. Um, at which point I think the main area of the campus is going to be complete. Um, there is sort of, we, we have a design and we have, well we've had about four designs for an extra um, special museum for the folk art right next door on, on, a, on a plot that belongs um, um, to my father as well. Um, but we're not really sure if that's gonna, ever going to be realized. So in this time, uh, obviously, uh, uh, software has changed, technology has changed, and I'm wondering how do you see kind of few, you know, immediate and future changes in, in, in the way you're approaching uh, not only the design process but the building process and then, uh, and then beyond? I mean, it, it does feel like we're on a cusp again, but it's not so um, clear necessarily. I mean... Well, there's obviously the threat that we're sort of repeating things and making them sort of uh, efficient in a, in a in a very sort of uh, one-dimensional way. That that's that's the danger you know, of of that sort of rabbit type architecture right. in its worst sense. On the other hand, we have really amazing tools, and we have that ever closer connection to manufacturing. Um, we're probably also in a very privileged uh, situation with uh, Switzerland having really good traditional craftsmanship but also people in that, those trades that are really interested in new methods and new production techniques, uh, the carpenters with their CNC milling machines mm -hmm. and so on. Um, I think there's a great opportunity there um, to bringing uh, the ideas, the design, and the, the, the execution closer together. I, th I also 
we see as every new tool as an added tool. Um, there's nothing that replaces mm -hmm. a different technique. I mean, we still do hand sketches and hand drawings sometimes of, of certain elements, um, and every you know we still build physical models as much as and you know cut them with a, with a with a knife as much as we 3D print them. Um, so every every advancement technology is an, an, a, a bonus. So I'm excited uh, you're teaching a summer workshop. Uh, this summer and wanted to hear a little bit uh, both about that but also about pedagogy and how uh, you know we can push these kinds of explorations again um, in in schools um, it's been very interesting for me I mean just um, a lot of the material research right now is being done more in the kind of private uh, sector or by you know kind of large firms developing their own or you know the way you work but it's not so common anymore in in schools and I'm just kind of wondering about uh, your thoughts about that um, well the premise of the summer course was really that um, it ties in with our office of that you look out and see what technology or industry or research is being done and use that as inspiration um, to come up with a design. And it's really a design tool um, to, to, to help you uh, come up with new ideas. And so what we're actually doing is um, we've gone to material researchers um, at the ETH, which sort of showed us a product made out of fly ash, um, a garbage material that's going to um, normally go into landfills. It's sort of the end of production. And so they're trying to give that a new life, sort of recycle the material um, or upcycle the material into a building product to produce a foam uh, that can be up to 90% aerated and potentially be some of our new um, building insulation materials, but maybe even um, some structural um, elements. Um, material scientists, uh, they basically design pieces of material that are this size. Um, so we said, if you're going to want to use this for architecture, you're going to have to up the scale. Um, at the same time, um, we wanted to sort of, sort of look at the transitional geometry course that um, Trevor was teaching here um, and said, you know, you're doing really great stuff, but it's all this size. And th th things change when you increase the size. I said, we needed, we needed to have a design studio where we sort of use this technology to say, what happens when you make it big? Um, what is the potential of it? Um, how does that create space? And so sort of that was the premise of, of doing this. So we're actually going to take uh, four digital um, manufacturing technologies. We're going to 3D print the foam. Um, we're going to uh, cast um, uh, the foam into sort of exoskeletons on uh, traditional uh, 3D, uh, um, 3D printers that you also have here in the, in the shop. Um, we are going to use um, a large-scale 3D printer. We're talking about 150, 180 by 120, so most probably the largest 3D printer um, sort of um, out there. Um, and going to either create um, sort of the formwork directly with that or to make positives um, that we can then uh, vac vacuum press uh, molds around. And the fourth technique that we're going to use is uh, sort of milled uh, foldable formwork um, out of a CNC cutter um, to sort of see how you could potentially fold formwork, make it flat, you can ship it easily to places um, and a different, different technique. Um, and we also so said we wanted to create an architectural space with these casts. So rather than um, producing just sort of columns or objects uh, that you could sort of walk around, uh, we said that they actually need to bridge um, a space between a floor and a wall so that you can walk underneath it, you walk around it, you can assemble a whole series like the way we did the Papardelle and, and you know, create a new architectural space. Um, so it's sort of exciting because it's, um, taking research and um, architectural design practice and sort of combining them um, and taking it um, to the students and sort of saying these, these are techniques that can inspire you, that can sort of make you think about um, what architectural space can be, how you can manufacture it, try out new tools, new software, uh, new technologies. Um, and that's sort of really what interests us in terms of um, sort of bringing that to the architectural education. But I want to one, make one brief remark on sort of architecture education. And I, we had a really, I think, a really nice day here today. And, and I think lots of things are moving in a, in a really good direction at, at Columbia. 
um, with sort of lots of models lying around and all sorts of techniques being used and so on. But I think the one essential thing, and I, uh, maybe that's more in Switzerland, but I have the feeling that it's a global problem, is that architecture is becoming more and more self-referential. -refer mm -hmm. You know, everybody's looking at everybody else and so on. And I think the only place where we can really sort of, w where you can learn this and experience this is at a university, mm -hmm. that you really sort of go into other fields, get your inspirations from, from where, it doesn't matter from where, but just don't sort of circle mm -hmm. around your own profession all the time. And that's something that you can't fix afterwards. I mean, this is something that really the university has to deliver, mm -hmm. and I think that's something Columbia's probably traditionally doing really well and is doing well now, but it's, uh, it's such an important part of, of education. You, so I'm, I'm curious about, uh, so yeah, the work is, Instagrammable. <laughs> there's a kind of right. I mean, it's in general. I mean, there's the the. the I mean, I think that's what's interesting about. Well, there's a lot of reasons why the the work is really fascinating, but is also such a sense of focus where, it, you know, it's a kind of exploration outside of um, the images that are circulating. Let's say, um, which is really great. I want to make sure there's enough time for questions. Um, Not um, not at present, although we have our first commission um, in, in Germany. Um, and I could be that doesn't count. It <laughs> does! From, from Switzerland <laughs> to Germany, that doesn't count. It does count. They speak a different language there, you know? <laughs> they detail as well. <laughs> Um, we've, we've just been commissioned uh, to do a, a factory, an extension to a factory there. Um, and actually, if, if manufacturers of some of the facades, the, 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 the glittery, hairy building was produced by them, and then they asked us, uh, um, can't you extend um, our building and design something that we can manufacture and, and um, uh, uh, put, on, put on to the, um, sort of as a face for our new, um, new building. Um, but we're we're waiting for those commissions. So if you have any friends here in the U.S. which need some uh, uh, practicing architects, um, uh, let us know. You're welcome to redo this auditorium, by the way, uh, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> um, at, at what point, what stage in your practice, and why did you decide to internalize construction management to your practice, and and how did? How did it sort of affect the way that you think of fabricating things? Should I answer? You can answer this. Well, we, we started trying to do our own construction management, but we were the construction managers. So I think um, I think already sort of in the second project, we were trying to do this. Um, but uh, as, as much as we're generalists, we can't do everything. And we learned that um, the hard way. Um, if, if, there's the, if there's a great engineer, use the great engineer. Um, if there's a great uh, lighting designer, use the great lighting designer. Um, don't try to do everything by yourself. Um, however, we had, we had then um, hired an external construction management uh, team to come and help us on a project. And when the project was completed and we were about to approach them about the next project, they said, um, don't you want your own construction management team? How about I come work for you? Uh, which was great because it meant that they really enjoyed what we were doing, but they also saw that they, the process would be so much easier um, if we were on one team. It has helped to sort of, it has helped to um, reassure clients in a way because we have our own people, they know how we operate, and if we come up with something that is, uh, that is not conventional, um, we are much quicker in assigning sort of a, a realistic time frame or budget to it um, with our own team. Um, and that has helped us with clients, for example, and we could deliver on things like that, for example, with that residential building that we just showed. Uh, we're being quite realistic from early on, even though we didn't exactly know where the sort of journey was supposed to, sort of, to go. Um, th thank you for the presentation. Um, and thank you especially for starting with your own education. I think being back at the scene of the crime at Columbia is, is fantastic. Um, and I'm curious about perhaps the influence of your education in a remark you made at the beginning, which is that there are plenty of clean boxes in the world and plenty of people who want to make them, um, in Switzerland in particular, uh, but globally as well. 
Um, and you know, why is that not you? Uh, why, did, why does that not appeal to you? And what appeals to you instead in terms of maybe some of the things that were going on um, here at Columbia 20 years ago in terms of pattern, in terms of surface, in terms of deep surface, um, and uh, those types of geometries or, or, or methods. So why do people like that box and why is it not for you? I spent my whole childhood in galleries and exhibition spaces and they all looked the same. <laughs> um, and the idea of this white gallery box, i just seen too many of them. Um, and in the end, these, these paintings or this artwork often ends up in somebody's home and somebody's office, and it's not the white box anymore anyway. Um, so why don't we show the artwork in different spaces? And um, we could give a whole lecture about how what we think exhibition spaces should or could be, um, that they're basically the ones we designed were all extensions of my father's living room. Um, they were more living rooms that he could then play with, and. Um, we're finally getting to the point where he's starting to put um, actually more stuff into all the all of the spaces, and we hope that he will open it to the public um, in the near future. Um, but sort of having grown up in Switzerland, um, um, and you sort of see the sort of this rip good quality repetitive white box, um, it definitely wasn't something I wanted to make. I mean, my, my greatest um, inspiration is maybe Eero Saarinen, um, not only because of the TWA building, which is just so beautiful, but if you go and look at his work, um, there's so many different things that he's explored, and not necessarily would you recognize um, that certain buildings uh, belong to the same architect, and that's sort of the route that I wanted to go here. I wanted to be able to do those explorations that we had done here in, st in studios, and, and take them out. And um, you know, once we explored with soap bubbles and tried to figure out, you know, what type of architecture soap bubbles would produce, uh, the next time um, I was in, in, in Greg's studio and we were looking at algae and moss and lichen, and um, those are the type of buildings I wanted to build that were inspired by those things. I I did a, uh, a studio here with Homer Fahadi, and um, it was called Migrant Sites, and we were to improve an area of London at the time. Uh, by taking something quintessentially New York and transplanting it to London. Um, maybe it's also that notion of being being the foreigner, uh, being an, the odd one out to increase um, the awareness of things, of, of the, the way you perceive things, perception. Um, I don't know, in a world of blobs, I would probably start building boxes, but, but going to Zurich, I had this clear intention, or we had the clear intention of not becoming a typical Zurich office. So it might also be a bit of a childish subversiveness, but I think it also has its purpose. Okay, I thought I was going to do your response, but Amal stood up and came and sat oh, with really? you. So, yes, oh, really? it's I'm okay. I'm so sorry. I'm on automatic pilot so now. Just, it's the end of the semester. It's, it's totally Please go fine. Ahead. It's totally fine. <laughs> so, but I, I need to say something, right? At least it's, I've been looking at your work more in depth. Lila's um, going to kill me. No, it's... Um, okay. I... Um, just wanted to say that uh, looking at your work also with a little bit of time before hearing you, I really love that your uh, profile starts with this idea of this word joy, the idea of giving joy to people, your architecture giving joy, uh, being an experience of joy. And uh, so I read that and I was immediately very taken by that. And then as I started looking at your work, which is, you know, incredibly, uh, there's a lot of testing, there's a lot of intelligence, there's a lot of uh, curiosity, but it's also really funny. There is something that has a lot of humor in it. Um, maybe also the fact that your work, especially the wor all the work that you have done in the factory, is as a weird sense of scale, mm -hmm. uh, things are either a little too small or too big or too, uh, or too shiny or too uh, rigid or too many, you know, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and you feel it when you look at the project from the outside, you feel it when you were showing the images from the inside, you know, where suddenly these things are a little too big or a little too small. Uh, there's I found, even before hearing you, a lot of humor in your work. And it was 
very exciting because it's something that's actually very rare <laughs> in architecture. So on one end, I wanted to just uh, bounce it back off to you and ask you how much are you aware of it? How much do you um, forcefully pursue it? How much uh, are you willing to continue to take on this road that is kind of like a very exciting road in this world? Well, I have, I have two comments to that. Um, my first inter internship um, was with um, Ettore Sotsas's office in Milan. And um, Joanna Gravunder, uh, who works now out of um, San Francisco, um, was sort of showing me around and making me do things. And uh, she said, look, Nina, in the end, you design architecture when it either is really, really late at night or it's really cool. <laughs> Um, and I sort of took that on with, um, on with us. And you know, sometimes I say to the younger architects in our office, um, this is a profession which doesn't pay that well. If you don't have fun when you're doing this here, don't do it. Go do something else that pays better. And um, I think maybe that reflects in our, in our architecture. Um, if we're not enjoying ourselves all day, um, there's places where we can earn more money um, and uh, borrow ourselves just as much. So maybe that's where the fun Absolutely, and it's very perceivable, you know, also <laughs> listening to you. And then, you know, as a segue to that, I also was curious of, um, uh, obviously, the work you've done at the factory all started from this constraint of the box, right? You're given a box, and then in a way that pushed you very much also to think about a skin. So there is the box, and then there is this texture around it. There is a thickness, there is even a space, uh, but there is a little bit this um, tension between the simplicity of the box and the complexity of this world that is around the box. And then, of course, you show the house, and I've seen also a little bit some of the other work, and I'm curious of how much in the rest of the work uh, you are also looking at making that complexity thicker or deeper or, you know, more spatial. Um, I think that's why we tried to show the last project, um, is because it was a new build um, and it allowed something completely different. Um, uh, sometimes we're slightly nervous that we sort of get stamped by the office who can produce really beautiful skins. Um, and it wasn't by choice, it was due to the fact that those were the commissions we had um, where we were given a, a building to renovate. Um, but we'd really like to take that complexity um, into the form making, into the spaces, and I think um, some of that we try to show in the, in the courtyard house of, of how, um, it, not only in the form, but in the movement, um, it's a lot about movement through space, about creating um, sort of orientations, sort of self-reflecting, being playful, in the geometries, um, and I'm, I hope that we're going to get many more projects that we can build in, in that way. Great. Well, thank you so much. It was really uh, inspiring. So thanks so much. Thank you so much.